Let's move on to rules. All right, the first thing I'm going to worry about is comparisons. For example, are they the same? Are they kind of the same? This is actually what's interesting that same has to take on many dimensions because sets have kind of many dimensions of comparisons. We have things like this. Hey, look, we have collections of cards. Well, we have the same collection. Well, that's kind of interesting. Here's another one. Hey, look, I actually have all your cards. That's kind of an interesting same type of comparison. You have the same as ones I do, but then you actually have a couple that I don't have. That's interesting. Oh, wait. Um, we have sets of chairs and sets of students. Oh, darn, we have more students and chairs. That's kind of a comparison issue. I'm, I'm comparing things of completely different types, but I have a purpose behind it. So every one of those things that we naturally do are going to have a natural operator that I'm going to develop out of it. All right, the first thing that I'm going to talk about in terms of a comparison is going to be equality. I'm going to say set A is equal to set B. It better have a logical reason that makes sense to you. If I said this set of students, or let's say let's go to cards because it makes it more complicated when you compare people. This set of cards is equal to this set of cards. If I said that in your mind, what do you think it should represent? I, like, if, if I have a George Brett rookie year, you should have a George Brett rookie year. And if you have a George Brett senior, you know, last year, I should have a George Brett. It should be biconditional, right? It should be, if I have this card, you have this card. And if you have this card, I should have this card. So logically, it should make sense that, well, I think this really means in terms of logic, that for all possible, say C, let's do talk about cards, if it's in set A, then it's in set B. And if it's in set B, it better be in set A. This automatically causes an issue, though. What if I have two rookie cards and you have one rookie card? What would this still evaluate to? It would still evaluate to true, right? Because it's not asking for how many of C you have, right? It just simply says, do you have C? So one of the things that we'll do, since we have that particular issue, what if you have multiple cards of the same type? This wouldn't even work for that. Well, then we're going to go, OK, fine. We're going to simplify our life by talking about, eventually, uniqueness. I want unique cards. Well, I have five of those. Do you have it? Yes, that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> I don't care if you have five. Just tell me how many you have uniquely. That will be, a lot of times, we'll narrow it down that way. But by this definition, it allows things like, Let's say A is equal to 1, 1, 3, 4. And then B is equal to 1, 3, 3, 3, 4, 4. Given that, A equals B. Is the number 1 in A? Yes. Is it in B? Yep. Is every number that's in A in B? Yes. Is every number that's in B in A? Yes, so they're equal. But they have different numbers. I don't care about that. I'm interested in unique elements. That's what I'm checking. So that's cardinality. I mean, sorry, equality. I jumped to a word that's going to be. All right, subset. A is a subset of B, is now what we're looking at is to say things like, fine, for all cards, 
if A has that card, then B has that card. Then I'll say that A is a subset of B. That's a C with the line under. So Where? Really yes, okay. that's not a C. It's called, it's actually, I forget the proper symbol name for that. But it's a, well, if you look at it, it's kind of like a less than or equal to, but curved. And that's why they actually picked that symbology, is it looks kind of like less than or same as. If they were the same, wouldn't everything in A be in B? Yes, if they were the same. But on the other hand, it's asks like, look, all I'm checking to see is if A, what this looks like as a Venn diagram, this looks like this. There's A, there's B in my universe. Hey, look, A's inside of B. This actually gets down to, well, what if B actually has some elements that A doesn't have? That's called a proper subset. A proper subset, which looks like this, kind of like a, it's a curvy inequality type of thing. This is, now this is a little bit more complicated. All right, let me give you the book. This is the way the book writes it. For all elements x, if x is in A, then x is in B. And there exists an x such that x is in B and x is not in A. Here's my problem with their particular representation. This is correct. Look at the left and look at the right. Are they talking about the same x? No. What's the binding? Because this variable has been bound to all. What is its scope? That is the entire scope of that particular x, and it goes no further. What's the scope of this x? Right there. It's an entirely different x, but it's using the same symbol. So if they would have been a little bit smarter to make it less confusing, it would look like this. For every element that you see, if it's in A, then it has to be in B as well. And not only that, for some other element, it's special I found somebody that is in B and that guy is not in A. Different scopes, try different symbols because it'll make life easier to read. So what does this thing look like, a Venn diagram? What this looks like is to simply be this. Not only is A completely inside of B, there is a special number Y that's outside of A yet still in B. That's proper subset. B is literally bigger. It has more stuff. This is why we use our symbol less than, less than, or equal to. If it's less than or equal to, it could be equal, right? What subset? Not only is it inside, but it could be equal. So that's a proper subset. This also allows us to use this. A equals B. If you want to show this, it's enough to show A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. If you want to show equality logically, what's nice about both of these? Well, that's an implication, right? This says, if I would look at this as implication, this says, if C is in A, then C is in B. We would have to show that. And if C is in B, then the card is in A. Isn't that the if and only if statement? It's just a normal, it's the normal proof. How do I prove an if and only if? Go from left to right, go from right to left. They have to be equal. What are we saying? Every element from A is in B. Not only that, every element from B is actually in A. They have to be the same set. So this gives us a way to prove equality. Now, one last type. So we're on what, three? Now on to four called cardinality. Cardinality of a set is equal to the number of unique 
elements of the set. This automatically causes an issue. So, for example, what is the cardinality of one square happy face empty set? How much stuff is in here? There's four of them, right? What's the cardinality of the empty set? Zero. Right? It's, it's a set that has nothing in it. Here's a fun one. What's the cardinality of a singleton? That's pretty easy. One. What's the cardinality of the set that only contains the empty set. That's one as well. It'd been it, this gets a lot less confusing with if you don't use the brackets. If you would rather, if I would have rather done this, right? <coughs> that's just a symbol, right? There's one thing in it. Whatever that symbol represents really doesn't matter. But it's a set of a single thing. Well, what's in set? The empty set. So there's one thing in it. Now, on the other hand, we can notice the following definition. If the cardinality of a set is n, where n is one of the counting numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right? I go ahead and take the cardinality of this object, and I get a number. Call s finite. And now here comes the problem. If the cardinality of s is not finite, we call it infinite. So for example, what is the cardinality of 0, 1, 2, ellipsis? Will this spit out a single number? No. So I would just simply say it's infinite because it doesn't spit out a number, right? Just infinite. What does infinite mean? It didn't give me a number. <laughs> it's not finite. Now, the technique of counting is going to be, have to be modified. And what we're going to do for when we get to 2.5 is we will deal with sets that are not finite. And we're going to talk about how can we pair off, like, like shake hands. Like we can do it's easy if I have 10 students, 10 chairs, to say you can sit down. If I have 11 students, 10 chairs, you cannot sit down. Now it kind of like, well, how did you do that? Now let's do that same technique and go up to not finite things and ask for kind of interesting ways. And we'll talk about things like Hilbert's Grand Hotel, Cantor Diagonalization, which is really just how do we handshake things that are not finite.